Welcome to No Apologies. I'm Dana Lash. I think it's fair to say that we're living through, I think really the most perilous time in American history since the revolution in terms of a threat to our First Amendment rights. The left, who has always dreamed of shutting down speech from the right or really anybody who disagrees with them, frankly, think they found their silver bullet, so to speak. And that is the coronavirus, the pandemic, the lockdowns, because the pandemic now is creating this pretext in America for the government to determine who can speak and what they can say. So for now, it's a crackdown on people's right to form their own opinions and express those own opinions in public, all about the, the coronavirus and the policies being employed to fight said virus. But there is this ominous feeling that once this precedent of censorship is established, and make no mistake, the White House is on a mission to crack down on so-called misinformation. Once the censorship starts, it's not gonna stop. Let's be clear too, the people the White House once censored are almost entirely on the right. So here's White House Communications Director Kate Bedingfield yesterday, watch. Certainly they should be held accountable. And I think you've heard the president speak very aggressively about this. He understands this is an important piece of the ecosystem. But it's also the other thing the president has pointed out and spoke to when he was asked about this yesterday is it's, it is also the responsibility of the people creating the content. And again, I would go back to, you know, there are conservative news outlets who are creating irresponsible content that's sharing misinformation about the, vi about the virus that's getting shared on these platforms. I don't know where to even start with this. At least she's being honest, right? But there it is. It's conservative news outlets. They're spreading misinformation, says the White House, and it's killing people. In fact, here's President Biden on this killer misinformation that's coming, of course, from conservative thinkers, news outlets, and influencers. Watch. What's your message to platforms like Facebook? They're killing people. I mean, it really, they are, look, the only pandemic we have is among the unvaccinated, and, that, and, they're, and they're killing people. Yeah. The Biden administration says, yes, Facebook is killing people. So mark yourself safe from Facebook killing you. Mark yourself safe from Facebook killing you, right? Isn't that like the little graphic you can mark yourself safe? Well, and the Biden White House says they have to apply relentless pressure to Facebook and Twitter and news outlets all to censor misinformation about the coronavirus because it's killing people. Now, notice how they don't call this information that is killing people disinformation or misinformation, because disinformation is information that is purposefully designed to mislead or lie to people. Disinformation would be like that classic example about the limitations of free speech. You know, that trope about screaming fire in a crowded theater, which is a horrible, ignorant misrepresentation of Shank, which is the ruling on that, and it was overturned 60 years later. That would be an example of disinformation that could intentionally hurt people, right? Social media platforms and news outlets, they could be liable for that kind of disinformation because disinformation is a purposeful lie. And if that lie harms people, then that's a problem. I mean, there's protected speech and forms of speech that are not protected against liability. But see, the White House isn't using the words disinformation because there's nothing actionable here. I mean, you have people innocuously exchanging ideas. No, they're using the word misinformation on purpose because it's a way to censor things they dislike. Misinformation is simply information that someone, like the government, deems inaccurate or just wrong think. With misinformation, there is no intent to mislead. It could just simply be a person expressing a contrary opinion or different interpretation of data, etc. The White House wants this kind of speech censored too if it goes against their narratives on the coronavirus. But that's the question though, right? Who decides what is misinformation? The government does, apparently. They wanna be the arbiters of who gets to speak and what they get to say and what information is worthy. Why does the government suddenly get to do this? Because misinformation is killing people, the Biden administration tells us. Now, here is someone who actually works in misinformation, if she is misinformation, herself, Jen Psaki, making a case for the government's newfound self-appointed power to censor speech that they call misinformation, which, let's be honest, it's just speech that they dislike. Watch. We are in regular touch uh, with these social media platforms, uh, and those uh, engagements typically happen through members of our senior staff, but also members of our COVID-19 team. Uh, given, as Dr. Mur Murthy uh, conveyed, uh, this is a big issue of misinformation, specifically on the pandemic. In terms of actions, Alex, that uh, we have taken, or we're working to take, I should say, from the federal government, uh, we've increased uh, disinformation research and tracking uh, within the Surgeon General's office. We're flagging problems 
problematic posts for Facebook uh, that spread disinformation. We're working with doctors and medical professionals to connect uh, to connected medical experts with popular with popular who are popular with their audiences with uh, with accurate information and boost trusted content. So we're helping get trusted content out there. Boost trusted content. Did you hear that? I wonder how many tax dollars are going towards promoting content on Facebook. You know, that's usually what you pay to do. Hmm. Maybe there could be a FOIA request on that. But that ought to scare every single American, regardless of where you sit on the political spectrum. This is a very dangerous shift, and it is absolutely intended to stifle a healthy debate about a wide range of highly controversial coronavirus policies that should be debated, like whether lockdowns are actually effective, whether kids actually need masks, and the vaccine or not, and, and how dangerous all of the other variants, including the Delta variant, actually is. We should be able to talk about these things freely. And when you're able to talk about things freely, you're going to find that people disagree and they sometimes are even going to get things wrong. Even experts like Dr. Fauci, who's been wrong so often based on the White House's new standard, Dr. Fauci should be censored for misinformation like yesterday. But all of this debate and questioning on corona, of coronavirus policy, that needs to stop, says the White House, because it could lead to misinformation and misinformation is killing people. So I should point out that this phenomenon is not just happening in America. This is New Zealand's prime minister here. She's responding to rumors of another lockdown. Listen to what she says, it's quite chilling, watch. So I continue to share the message. New Zealanders must prepare, but do not panic, prepare. And, and when you see those messages, remember that unless you hear it from us, um, it is not the truth. There it is. Orwell's 1984 happening in real time. Wrong think. Unless you hear it from us, it is not the truth, says the prime minister. Yeah, well, the government of New Zealand is saying that they are the single and only source of truth on the coronavirus. No other speculation allowed. And America and Western governments across the world are not just censoring speech. They're rolling back individual rights at lightning speed. And it seems like those changes are becoming permanent. Notice that? 15 days to slow the spread to a year of lockdowns and seemingly permanent masking for your children and really you. Remember, the argument was to avoid a surge on hospitals. There isn't a surge on hospitals or in them. But all of the masking of kids, the rumors of lockdowns from the Delta variant, they all seem to be gaining steam. And why? Because people could die. It's, oh, it's Facebook's killing people. It's always the same answer. And it's the same answer for why the Biden administration says that we must censor conservative thinkers, influencers, and outlets, because their misinformation about coronavirus, which is really just their opinions, which they have a right to express, is killing people. I mean, in fact, NPR, which is taxpayer funded, just ran a big piece talking about a number of different conservative websites and 12 entities total that are responsible for spreading most of the quote unquote misinformation on Facebook. And as I said, conservative, because it doesn't seem, they don't seem to be targeting anyone progressive and your tax dollars paid for that. So since misinformation is the reason after 250 years to remove your first and most fundamental right in the Bill of Rights, free speech, we should discuss the Biden administration's claim because it's killing people, you know, the misinformation. You would think people are just falling over dead like flies in the street from the Delta variant. So some quick facts because it's incredibly easy to lose perspective in all of this hysteria. So consider this, half of Australia is on lockdown right now. And how many deaths were there from the coronavirus in Australia to justify that? In a country of over 5 million, one man over 80 years old died. One man died from the Wuhan coronavirus yesterday. And I checked and there were currently about 25 people in all of Australia in the ICU for specifically the virus. But half of the country is in lockdown. Now in America, there is increasing pressure to force very wary parents to vaccinate children with these experimental, and they are experimental. I know Facebook says you can't say the phrase experimental, which is insane because it is going to be considered experimental until it goes through the full FDA approval process. And the only reason it's being administered now is because of emergency authorization, which considering that we've never had mRNA vaccines distributed this wide scale before, everything I just said qualifies it as being called experimental, but you can be censored on Facebook for simply saying that. 
but you know, the virus is killing children, everyone screams. How many children under age 18 have been killed by the virus and so far total? This is where it gets incredibly interesting. A Wall Street Journal piece had this story and it cites CDC figures from the CDC website that you can go and look up now. 335, and it was a Johns Hopkins study. All of them had secondary health conditions. Every single one had secondary health conditions. And by secondary health conditions, I mean sad issues like leukemia. Leukemia, that's pretty serious. So we can't actually be sure that a single child in America, a fatality is solely because of coronavirus. It's entirely possible. But the CDC is not going through and vetting all of these 335 American children and confirming that the fatalities were solely from complications related to coronavirus. I mean, let's say just all 335 children, American children, the, those, ju let's just say that those fatalities were from coronavirus. That would be 335 kids out of 75 million children under age of 18 in America. Fatalities within 18 months from the pandemic. Hmm. And a sidebar to note here, because everyone, I see a lot of individuals citing VAERS, V-A-R-E-S. That's a, for the lack of a better term, it's just basically a catch-all of all reports, every single individual who has supposedly contracted the coronavirus and it, and it looks at severity, et cetera. And there's a lot of criticism by those who are very, very ardently pro-vaccine, coronavirus vaccine, to say that you can't trust the VAERS system on this or the VAERS numbers on this because not every one of those have been vetted. Okay, well, that's the exact same thing with the number that I just gave you as it relates to the CDC, because we don't even know about, with, with all of this, we don't, even under, we don't even understand, as with some of these secondary complications, how that factored in. We don't know if these kids were healthy before. We don't know. I mean, that's just one of the, we have, we should be asking these questions. My point is, is that during a time like this, there are two things that are most important, data and transparency, and they are both in short supply. Think about this. There were thousands of suicides of kids under age 18 last year. And that statistic is rising due to lockdowns, many mental health professionals believe. Kids have basically zero chance of death from coronavirus, but yet the government is fixated on making sure that you vaccinate your child, which then contradicts everything that they said earlier into this pandemic. Fear, lack of transparency, and nothing on data is causing people to lose all perspective. In America, there were 249 deaths yesterday from coronavirus in a country of 360 million people. And the average age of those deaths continues to be about 78 years of age. And for all of the discussion about the Delta variant killing children, the data to support that claim is simply non-existent. And that's why it's incredibly important that a free people, if we are truly free, continue to discuss and debate and base our findings on facts, on data, and not just accept the hysteria about number of fatalities from any entity, particularly a government entity that has gotten so much wrong about the disease already. Now, why am I bringing how many people have died and who, who all the number, the number of people who've died and all the people dying from coronavirus? Because, well, people are being killed by misinformation is the argument that the administration is using to suppress your First Amendment rights. But the Delta variant, according to data, it's more transmissible, but way less deadly. And that's a good thing, because see, people are being killed by misinformation. That's always the reason that the government's going to give in order to impose any kind of draconian law or take away fundamental rights, like censoring, actually censoring your right to freely speak. And make no mistake, it is not going to end with censoring our right to freely express opinions and share them with others about coronavirus policies. Next, there's going to be a new crisis, I'm sure, that is killing people, and the reason people are being killed, they will say, is because, yes, misinformation about said new crisis. For example, they're already changing the language around climate change, and it's now a glo it's not called global climate emergency, and the climate emergency is killing people. They're already claiming that, and so there can be no more debate, no more opinions, and if you disagree, you're killing people too. We, the government, will tell you how to solve the problem, and we, the government, will censor any dissent. And we'll do that by calling honest opinions and legitimate debate on the climate emergency. We'll label that misinformation. And why must we censor this misinformation? Because it's killing people. Now, I believe this climate emergency that's killing people is coming next. But the point is, is there's always going to be another crisis because crisis 
Democrats and Western governments have discovered is the best way to control you. And when they can't convince you of their arguments for what they intend on doing, they'll just simply declare an emergency and say people will die unless you do exactly what they say. And if you disagree and you express any, any different opinion, then you yourself are then now guilty of spreading misinformation and a murderer, and that means they can censor you. Because lives are on the line. And the proof that people are being killed, well, apparently they don't owe you that. They're not going to tell you. They're the government. You do what they tell you. And if you disagree, they'll call that misinformation and take your voice and even your livelihood away from you. Just ask the people who've been deplatformed, like evolutionary biologist Eric Weinstein, who has simply asked questions about the vaccine and many others who are silenced or banned by YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter at the request of the, our government. Finally, there is an excellent series called Chernobyl on Netflix. It's about the infamous disaster at the Soviet nuclear facility. And it's incredibly relevant for the moment because the parallels to the Wuhan virus disaster are eerily similar. It shows how censorship makes dealing with a crisis not only impossible, but it makes everything worse. Now, I'm not sure that this was the director's intention when they actually made the series, but what the story demonstrates is how in the Soviet Union, thanks to communism's censorship of free speech, scientists could not say what needed to be said about the Chernobyl disaster. They were afraid of the Soviet government. The government had sole control over who could speak and who could be heard, and you say the wrong thing to Gorbachev, and then something that he didn't want to hear, like uh, Russian nuclear facilities had a meltdown that if left unaddressed, it's going to kill potentially tens of thousands of people. Well, you would find yourself in very deep trouble. So the Chernobyl crisis got much worse because it could not be dealt with, honestly, because the communist regime didn't want the nuclear disaster to make them look incompetent. They just wanted it to go away. However, what needed to be said was this. If the Chernobyl reactor was left unaddressed, its meltdown was going to cause its radioactive core to sink into the ground and very likely poison the water supply of Russia. And that unpleasant reality, that was being labeled misinformation at the time. It needed to be said to Soviet government leaders. Similarly, a worldwide disaster has unfolded with the coronavirus, which ironically originated in another communist country. And it's been made harder to deal with thanks to censorship in China and tragically, if the Biden administration has their way, it seems that same government censorship is coming here next. More debate, more information, more heterodox thinking is what is needed to beat this pandemic, not less. Challenging the consensus from arrogant government bodies, it's not spreading information. That's your right as a citizen. It is your right as a citizen and your duty as a citizen. It is about the power of the marketplace of ideas that allows out-of-the-box solutions so we can better negotiate the pandemic going forward. So, on misinformation, you have Jen Psaki, the White House communications director, Biden himself, others in the administration. They have to know better than to stifle free speech and debate. But why are they doing this still? To silence your right to disagree forever. All in the name of stopping people from being killed. Just a small sacrifice to pay, right? Our military is being forced to vaccinate, but not if Congressman Thomas Massey's new legislation to prevent mandatory vaccination is approved. We'll tell you all about it. Keep it here. Black Rifle Coffee Company is a veteran-owned coffee company, and they serve premium coffee to people who love America. Veteran, CEO and founder Evan Hafer, he spent over seven years on the ground overseas with U.S. Special Forces, spy fighting misinformation and communism and all the bad things. And as a CIA contractor, Black Rifle Coffee is committed to Evan's mission of supporting veteran and law enforcement and first responder causes. So this summer, Black Rifle Coffee Company invites you to stop arguing with people on Twitter about stupid things for five seconds and just enjoy a perfect cup of pour over or crack open a can of 300 on your next backcountry mission. You know, go to where the Wi-Fi is not. Black Rifle Coffee will go with you. They're there to fuel your way wherever the summer takes you. So. Head to blackriflecoffee.com slash Dana TV and order yours. Use code Dana TV at checkout for 20% off your purchase and your first coffee club order. Fuel your summer with America's coffee, Black Rifle Coffee. So the army wants to make vaccination mandatory. So much for the Democrats old slogan of my body, my choice. In any case, Congressman Thomas Massey of Kentucky is challenging this with a new bill, and he's here to discuss it. Congressman, we appreciate you joining us, and I know that you were hustling over because, you know, you were in D.C. doing your job 
voting right. and 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 you know doing the will of the people, which seems like only one side really does that anymore. But thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dana. Thanks for having me on and covering this topic. You know, this bill wasn't my idea. Um, somebody called me up who's a constituent who serves in our military. You know, these folks signed up to give their life if need be to protect our rights, our constitutional rights. And I just think it's wrong that we force them to take a vaccine, you know, experimental vaccine right now. But the concern is that um, when this becomes FDA approved, which they're, they seem to be rushing that a little bit, um, and they're anticipating that might happen in September, that immediately the army and the other branches of the military will probably move to try and make this mandatory. And that would all go into effect September 1st. And I, I, I do get, and I'm sure you feel the same way. Well, I know you do because I, I follow you on, on social media and I can see what you say about it. But I, I never I never understand why people get mad. Like, for instance, you know, the, the military members that are speaking up about this. What is the big hurdle in the administration just being as absolutely transparent as possible and giving everyone you know, the, the most up to date data as possible? Because you know, I said earlier, during a time like this, the two things that are most important are transparency and data. And it's really difficult to justify other people's anger at vaccine hesitant, particularly military members, when we don't have enough information to be able to make that kind of conclusion about risk assessment for our health. That's right. There are two pieces of really important data that aren't getting out there. Uh, I feel like the CDC, well, I know the CDC is covering up the fact that if you've already had COVID, that the vaccine, getting the vaccine hasn't proven in uh, real world results. Now in a test tube, they have reason to believe it might help. But in the real world results, there's no proven benefit of the vaccine if you've already recovered from COVID. Now, if you couple that with the other fact that's not uh, very well discussed, the military themselves have noticed that they have this adverse reaction of myocarditis, which is a swelling of the heart that is greater than the general population uh, in the time you know, following taking the vaccine among members of the military, not just among the general population, and it's specifically an issue for folks who are in that age where you may have just enlisted, you know, between the ages of 18 and uh, 27, it seems to be a very prevalent, well, not a very prevalent side effect. Don't let me say that, it, mm. you know, it's still a rare reaction. It's enough to ask questions. You, right, and I just think, you know, it should be a choice. Now, the rebuttal is, People say, oh, you know, you're in the military, you get seven or 10 vaccines anyway. It's the first thing that happens in boot camp, and we all know it, and you signed up for it. Well, they signed up for that those vaccines, that's true, but they didn't sign up for a new vaccine. When they enlisted, yeah. they didn't know this was going to be a vaccine. And there's a history here too, Dana. You know, the anthrax vaccine, uh, when that first came out, if you were going to go, be deployed to the Middle East, they made it mandatory for members of the military. And the, and the GAO did a report and there were three congressional hearings on this covering the fact that we lost uh, members of the military. They either took an early retirement in the case of officers who were able to or didn't re-up. Uh, you know, obviously if you're enlisted, you've made a commitment to stay in the military, but there were even some people who were willing to take dishonorable discharge or uh, uh, a general discharge in some cases. And you know, it's, you can't just quit the military. I know that and people on the internet are trying to say you're stupid because you, if you think you can quit the military, but there are officers mm -hmm. who can make decisions about whether to stay or go. And there are people who are gonna try and seek religious exemptions. I just think it's a really bad force shaping tool to try and sort our military members this way. Yeah, and, you're, and to your point, uh, talking with Congressman Thomas Massey, uh, to your point, Congressman, on, you know, will they sign up for these vaccines? Well, they sign up for vaccines that have been out for quite a long time. They have gone through the FDA approval process. It's not just being used for emergency authorization. And they've also seen any kind of, you know, side effects or potential side effects. They've been around long enough where they've got a, a significant uh, group of individuals that they can make conclusions, you know, about how it's going to affect other people's health and, and very, you know, 
know, and they're transparent about it. Whereas with this, and I understand we've had a lot of grace for the government dealing with a brand new virus like this, but it doesn't seem that that grace has been extended to people who still would like a little bit more information just so that they can feel that they have done everything they could to inform themselves about everything possible related to this vaccine. There's a shaming, there's a shaming effort going on here. Oh, there is. They're, they're trying to shame you. And, you know, it takes sometimes it takes years to know what the exact effects of a vaccine were. There's speculation. Uh, of course, it's not been proven. And we've not really proven anything about what causes Gulf War syndrome. The folks who've come back from the Gulf War and have long term uh, health effects. But it seems to be a, a prevalent problem more so than, you know, you would expect to see in the military otherwise. But the thing that's unique about them is they took the anthrax vaccine and uh, which wasn't necessarily required in other areas. So there's speculation that that may have had something to do with it. I think if you cared, even, you know, if you weren't looking out for members of the military and all you cared about was defending this country, I would think you would want to, you know, diversify your risk. And does it make sense to have every pilot, everybody that's qualified to fly an airplane in the Navy or the Air Force or the Army or the Marines, does it make sense to have them all take this vaccine? Wouldn't you want to have a few who didn't? I mean, even if you made a policy that says everybody's going to get the vaccine, I think it'd be a good idea to stick some placebos in there just in case, you know. And that's the other thing. These are the type of members who we who we might lose. They may decide if they are able to, to to resign their commission or to take early retirement or to leave without their retirement if they're officers. These are trained pilots. Some of these people, I just uh, received a note from somebody who's Special Forces Green Beret, who says, you know, they will take the consequences, whatever it is. Maybe it's military court. Maybe they are convicted there if they can't get a religious exemption. We don't want to lose our most qualified, our healthiest, our, our best trained members of the military. It'd be tragic to lose even you know one due to this policy mm. so i just yeah. think let's let's honor them just because they take other vaccines that have been proven and tested over time doesn't mean that they should be forced to take this one and one bit of good news i just got another co-sponsor on this bill today we have 27 co-sponsors excellent that's very good news uh, talking with congressman thomas massey i wanted to ask you congressman you know you're there in dc right now in fact we just noted how you you were very generous with your time hustling over a, while you're representing representing the people uh i've noticed and more republicans and i uh, and this this is coinciding with the onset of the everything about the delta variant but i have noticed more republicans being a little bit more vocal or for the first time speaking out and encouraging people to get vaccinated. I was listening to a soundbite with Mitch McConnell earlier. I saw that Senator Roy Blunt had tweeted something about this. Now I know it's still few and far between because I think everyone is very respectful of people coming to their own conclusions about what to do, what's best for them and their family. But do you feel that there is, there's pressure on, on the Republican party with all the Delta variant stuff to to do that or do you think that there I, I, what 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 is it what what do you attribute this to well first of all there's you know there's a new variant i call it the texas variant those texas legislators flew to dc and six mm -hmm. of them came ill and some of the staff members in dc one of pelosi's staff members there are going to be all kinds of variants um, and there are variants that aren't even documented frankly i you know i think they're maybe worried about liability i've seen people on t on tv Here's the message that I would send strongly to everybody, Dana. Don't listen to a politician and don't listen to a bureaucrat. Go see your doctor. If there's somebody who's going to be responsible for taking care of you five or 10 years from now because it's a family doctor, listen to that person. They've got a medical mm -hmm. education. Most of these folks up here are scientists, but they're political scientists. They've, <laughs> they've got nothing but a political science degree, if anything. And I wouldn't listen to a politician, whether they tell you to take it or not, go listen to your doctor. Yeah, that's a good point because we, we wouldn't listen to the, these politicians where it concerns firearms. And I don't know why we'd listen to them on, you know, anything. We, we appreciate your opinion. Thank you, elected official. That's, you know, that's great. I wanted to ask you too, uh, I noticed in Pasadena, Pasadena, California, they're requiring all city employees to be vaccinated. Now, if ever there was a point, and I'm, I am very much individual liberty on this. You know, what, however, if someone wants to get vaccinated, I don't judge them, I don't shame them. If they don't want to get vaccinated for their own reasons, 
same thing. Uh, but I was I w was reading this piece, and one of the city manager, Steve Rommel, had said uh, they were concerned if a police officer arrives at your home, a firefighter, because you need assistance. Uh, you, you don't get to choose if we send one of the vaccinated ones or or non-vaccinated ones. What? I would think that maybe, it just seems to me that if they're being called out there, you might be facing a greater threat at that particular point, um, maybe perhaps than that. What are your thoughts on this? And, and, and is there, can they actually do that? Can city, can public workers be forced to be vaccinated? You know, I think the most critical example would be in a hospital, for instance, could, could or should uh, the hospital require people who are gonna see patients to get the vaccine? Well, if you're gonna do that, it at least needs to be based on science. And what you would want to know is not whether the person has the vaccine, you'd want to know, are they able to spread the virus or not, right? And mm -hmm. what we've seen so far, at least in the data from Israel, is that if you've got evidence of a prior infection, for instance, you test a positive from antibodies as a result of having COVID and recovered from it, that you are probably even less likely to spread the virus than if you've had one of the vaccines. So if they're gonna implement a policy like that, at least make it science-based and at least recognize natural immunity as a real thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I have to get your uh, I have to get your reaction to Congressman to some of the stuff that we've heard from the Biden administration. We had Jen Psaki out talking about how Facebook and social media platforms uh, misinformation. With, uh, Joe Biden saying that Facebook is killing people and then trying to walk that back. And then you had uh, the White House communications director saying that well, it's conservative websites that are spreading misinformation on these platforms, which I thought was a very interesting, it's almost like they try to prove our point about Section 230 uh, when talking about these uh, yes. talking about these entities. But what, so what is misinformation? Because lab leak was misinformation until it wasn't, until Joe Biden decided just this week to now give some, now give, lend some credence to lab leak and actually affirm that as a possibility. So who gets to determine what is or isn't misinformation? And are you worried about this censorship? I'm extremely worried about it. They have really crossed the line here. I mean, Fauci at times has to be misinformation. If you care, uh, compare him to Fauci today, when he said, don't wear a mask, it's not gonna help. Was that information at the time he gave it? And then you had Facebook who was banning anybody or at least blocking their posts that if they tried to even raise the idea that this was a man-made virus and may have come from Wuhan, but now that's accepted as the most likely source of this virus. It, I guess misinformation, Dana, is any time a person doesn't agree with the government narrative. And that is, that is really dangerous. The only way you get to the truth is you have competing ideas and everybody puts out their, the facts and the data to back them up. But listen to this, Dana, the fact checkers for Facebook that do their vaccine fact checking are funded by the Robert Woods Johnson Foundation, which, could, which has $2 billion of Johnson & Johnson stock. So the fact checkers for the vaccines on Facebook are being funded by a, a, an organization that holds $2 billion of vaccine manufacturer stock. You're gonna let them decide what's misinformation? That is really dangerous. Now you've got social media, you've got the pharma, pharmaceutical companies and the Biden administration all getting together and deciding what is uh, fact and what is fiction. When in fact, I have proven that the CDC still has fiction on their website uh, from back in December. And they told me that I was right and that they would change their website and they never have. They said that uh, the vaccine was 92% efficacious if you'd already recovered from COVID or had evidence of prior infection. They based that on the trial data from Pfizer and the Pfizer trial data said no such thing. They still haven't updated their website. Wow. Wow. Yes, but everybody else, you know, everybody else has the misinformation. Right. Good heavens. Congressman Thomas Massey, we so appreciate your time and uh, stay safe with that Texas variant. You know, those Democrats up there, stay safe from that variant. Just don't get near those people. We appreciate we, your time. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Thanks, Dana. <laughs> so speaking of those Texas Democrats, they fled to stop, they said, democracy from being taken away from the people. And in fact, they they did that, but not in the way that they actually took democracy away from the people. And now they're going to be taking salaries away too. And then they went and gave a bunch of people in Washington the Wuhan coronavirus. The latest on those Democrat super spreaders. Keep it here.
Well, when Democrats aren't super spreading socialism, seems like they are super spreading the Delta variant. Texas State Representative Briscoe Kane, who has the coolest name that has ever been given to an elected official, is here to give us an update on the mini pandemic caused by those very heroic civil rights fighters from Texas. Good to see you, sir. Thanks so much for your time. I, I've got to get your, your take on this. They ran away and, and then they infected everybody else in D.C. They're, they're so brave. You know, I'm seeing a lot of them act like this is some stand and they're posting Gatson flags saying, come and take it. And you're like, that's the literal opposite. You ran from a fight. <laughs> you ran and gave it. I mean, that's that's the opposite of come and take it. Cowardice. And now we see the hypocrisy of, you know, the lamestream media, because if they would be accusing Republicans of trying to murder the president or the vice president, instead they're trying to make it about some privacy. Look, yeah, you know, they took a case of Miller Lite up there, and now they're going to come back with, I guess, six, six corona cases. Um, but but it's just, it's hypocritical. It's silly. Yeah, it is. I have to get your reaction, too, to this. This was a tweet from Donna Howard. Uh, she said she was caught uh, by Cassie Dillon. She said, we need to follow the science here. Texas needs to change course, allow for universal mask wearing. Same person pictured on the flight with no mask. She was calling for universal mask wearing. This was today. This was this morning at 8.45 a.m. Of course, several days after she was on that plane with no mask and they're all spreading coronavirus. Any any thoughts on that? I saw Cassie's tweet and I retweeted it. Actually, I saw you earlier had done the same. Here's a funny one. It's a private charter. Guess what? Federal law mandates you wear a freaking mask on a private charter. I didn't know that. I don't wear masks anyways. But hey, these people do. You and I have never supported mask wearing, but they're dogmatic about it and they're showing their hypocrisy. Of course, look, this had nothing to do with election bills and other things. They're just up there, you know, fundraising, having their hair smelled by Creepy Joe and whatever, you know, a lot of them are wanting to run for Congress. It's all a political stunt at uh, the loss for Texans. I mean, we, we've got yeah. election need to do, but they're more than that. Bill's dealing with a, lowering a loss. Yeah. Yes, and, and that's a really good point because lowering property taxes, there's a bunch of things that, you know, we're all waiting for. But I wanted to ask you, too, because one of the other things that's up is uh, salaries are for legislative staffers are going to be running out because they're and I would imagine that affect does that affect your that affects your staff as well. Yes, all staff of the, of the legislature and, and agencies that are legislative agencies, um, those those folks will be furloughed. Well, We'll figure out what I have to do. I mean, I think a lot of the Democrats knew that and they, they took the card. Now, um, whether the governor should have vetoed it, it's another question. But look, they're they're up there playing yeah. these games um, at the expense of everybody. Yeah. And and a, a quick question, too, on the you mentioned the uh, uh, they don't this isn't really about elections for them, which it's not. They keep saying photo ID. They keep saying voter ID, et cetera. Texas makes it so easy. I mean, we've all read the law. There's nothing Jim Crow about it. It's just that these are the same accusations that were thrown towards Georgia. But here's the thing. Why aren't they for just abolishing ID? If ID is racist for voting, then why is it not racist for renting a car, getting a driver's license, getting the vaccination, or just pretty much going anywhere, buying liquor, tobacco, getting on a plane, or going to one of the events that they were they were promoting, which required photo ID to even get in in the first place? So why aren't they calling calling for abolishment of ID? Yeah, Dana, you're asking a lot. You're asking for intellectual consistency. You know, that's a that's a hard one to get from the left. I don't think you're going to get it. Look, several of these members, in fact, one of them recently shown almost crying on TV, demanding, let me vote, told me on the floor, you know, as the chairman of the elections committee tells me, look, honey, we know there's not suppression in this, but we have to walk out. And that was during the regular session before they broke quorum. Three of the four I've seen are the most, you know, in front of the TV have said they know it isn't suppression. They know we're not all racist, but they've got to do this for their national party. I, it's really hurt some relationships here in the House. It's, it's tough to take, right? We can discuss policy, but name calling like that, such a disgusting word of racism and being a suppressor, they've gone too far. Mm, last question for you. You're talking to Texas State Representative Briscoe Kane, which I know I've said it already, but you do have the literally the coolest name of anybody in Texas. Uh, how do you think voters are going to repay this? How are they going to remember this? That's a great question. I actually think they're going to remember. Look, last time they did this kind of stunt in 2003, we flipped some seats. I think the longer they're gone, the better we're off. Uh, their voters are upset. <laughs> and I, I've heard through the rumor mill that some of them realize that and they're very concerned about their seats. 
people at a very minimum want you to show up to work. And they've done exactly not that. They're not showing up to work mm -hmm. to do the job they were elected to do. They weren't elected to go to D.C. and party up with Chuck Schumer. Right. And eat fruit into the shape of smiley faces like Gene Wu. I mean, it's uh, oh, okay. only in America. Yeah. Texas State Representative Briscoe Kane. Very good to see you. Thank you so much, sir, for your time. God bless, Dana. Mm -hmm. All right, folks, up next, Democrat Eric Swalwell. He's very busy again, this time using the government to fulfill more carnal desires. It's money this time. Money, money, money. We'll discuss all of that next. Keep it here. It seems Democrat Eric Swalwell consistently has trouble controlling his bodily impulses. He in infamously tooted on live television, right? Remember, that is the smartest thing that he ever said. And we're going to watch it again because I just want to make everybody happy. The president used taxpayer dollars to ask the Ukrainians to help him cheat an election. That actually, they, we did not add that. That was not added. That was not anything that we did. That was literally his, that was him. That was his thinking out loud. God bless America. But Swalwell's accident on live television, that's not what I'm talking about when I speak of Swalwell's unrestrained fleshly impulses. And I'm also not talking about that Chinese spy that Congressman Swalwell allegedly had a dalliance with, right? That one, right, sir, right there. Now here he is, right there, that's Eric Swalwell, enjoying the perks of being a public servant of the people, hard at work, being wined and dined by beautiful foreign agents who want to cozy up to a suave American politician like Eric Swalwell, so maybe they can perhaps influence him? This communist Chinese informant was so into Eric Swalwell that not even like him actually farting on live television, that didn't even put her off. And that should have been the first red flag that she was a spy. Now, some guys, I guess, just have game, I guess. Can't even be serious with that. In any case, what's Democrat Eric Swalwell's latest physical desire that he's been able to fulfill? Well, they agreed, really, the same desire that most politicians fall victim to. So check this out. There's a number of outlets reporting this, including Fox News. Swalwell has spent thousands of campaign dollars on booze, limo services, and over $20,000 at a hotel where his wife worked. Now, from the article, quote, the tens of thousands of campaign dollars include those limo car luxury services, luxury hotels, the, oh, sidebar, that was uh, also the Ritz-Carlton at Half Moon Bay, high-end restaurants and alcohol delivery services, alcohol delivery, over the course of the second quarter, according to FEC records reviewed by Fox News. The California congressman appears to have been driven in style, end quote. Yes, he was. His FEC records show that the campaign spent over $10,000 on 26 rides from various luxury car services and limousines. In fact, they say Swalwell's campaign also spent over $26,000 on luxury hotels. Hmm. The FEC records reveal the California Democrats' campaign spent over $7,000 at luxury restaurants and steakhouses in D.C. In quote, aren't these the same people that tell you to stop eating red meat, by the way? Have you noticed just how rich Democrats get from being in government? I mean, it's really true, I think, of all politicians, most politicians, I suppose, but so many de Democrats never even work in the private sector, and then they become millionaires. So in other words, they never actually create anything of value for other people. Like Bernie Sanders, for instance, who's literally like Karl Marx, never worked a private sector job in his life, or Barack Obama, or Joe Biden and AOC. AOC was at least a bartender. She still doesn't understand what capital, capitalism is at all, but whatever. The point is, is that they all seem to get incredibly wealthy when they get elected to office. How does that happen? <laughs> Magic. Once they are guys like Eric Swalwell, they declare themselves servants of the people, and then they put their face in the trough of endless tax dollars that you provide, of course, and many enrich their relatives with useless board positions and companies. Hunter Biden can tell you all about that. Yeah, these Democrat politicians, they get the best steak dinners, and they don't even have to wear masks indoors like you. Just ask Gavin Newsom, because remember, he was at French Laundry with his little shindig last year, all maskless, no social distancing. And that was before anyone had been vaccinated and during the height of the pandemic. Being a Democrat politician's a great gig if you can get it. Way better than having to actually work for your money in the private sector. Karl Marx knew that. That's why he never worked. He knew it was for chumps. Yeah, free chicks, free money, free luxury hotels and limos. And the best part, I'm sure Eric Swalwell would tell you if he was here, it's all paid for by you, the American people. 
That does it for us tonight. Thanks for tuning in. Good night and don't bend the knee.